walking the path together. Jonah and the tree. You say you don't love that tree, but you do. Are you like this with anything that gives you food and shade? Oh, all of you get more rattled at the sound of my voice in your satiny throats because you're afraid of how stupid you'll look. But I come to tell you, compassion always looks stupid to those well-fed in a shady spot while time bakes the earth. Love looks stupid, too, as if the lover had no more sense than to fling herself into the blank sky. She would soon fall out of, like you, Jonah, back to the land where a tree may mean all because it makes you the god of it. But if you lie there long enough in the rain, you will remember how the wet ground stretches itself open, makes earth and sky the inside of a whale, night unfolding into day, day unfolding into night, in its old migration back to me. Once you have gone so far, how can you not let others return? The further we go, the more we can help others find their way. In writing together, we can return to the real story of what we're meant to live, rather than the stories projected upon us. Facilitating this work for most of us was one of those calls I couldn't ignore. Like many of you, I found writing in my journal, as Kay Adams sometimes says, turned out to be a career path. <laughs> I started facilitating community writing workshops 23 years ago. For eight years, I facilitated workshops at a local housing authority for women of color, all recovering from abuse, addiction, extreme poverty, lack of education, opportunity, and little sense of their own raw worth. They came, sometimes shaky because of a new med or a boyfriend arrested for sexually abusing their daughters, sometimes scared of what they would say and whether they could spell their best words, sometimes thrilled to get a break from the kids or grandkids they were raising. In Transformative Language Arts in, in Action, co-edited with my Goddard colleague Ruth Farmer, which Kay Adams was series editor for, here's something I wrote about that housing authority group. The circle around the table turned into a crescent of women on stage facing an audience of over 200 people at our local art center in September 2006. Our anthology, A Circle of Women, A Circle of Words, was just published. None of us on stage, because of the lighting, could see the audience. But we heard their laughter and felt their attention as they listened. Mickey, diagnosed with severe schizophrenia, in a suit jacket, dress pants, and silk shirt, couldn't stop smiling. Juliana wrapped her considerable hair in purple African cloth from her Nigerian homeland. Ella, previously the quietest woman we knew, who also knew dire poverty, illness, and abuse, wore her best church dress. And while she looked down, she kept grinning. Marilyn, a Lakota woman who lost her dreams because of illness, took the mic with ease and read this. My heart takes up its task again when I open my eyes in the morning from yet another series of dreams my consciousness is left to decipher. I don't like it when my mind gets in the way of my melting heart, my joyful heart, my struggling to grasp the deeper meaning heart, my bleeding heart, and oh, my brave heart so wanting to cover us all. This was the first and only time in our community so far that women of public housing had their say. The mostly middle class audience, including city commissioners, and various movers and shakers from our town mingled easily with the expansive friends and family of the women. Juliana brought everyone she was related to and other women, almost everyone we knew. They knew. After the reading, the women waited in a line with me to shake hands and sign books. It's like a wedding, I whispered to them. It's better than my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's the best night of my life, said another. Flo Latiker, a Native American woman who, after getting pregnant as a teen, ended up homeless, reflected on this workshop, telling me this. It's been over 10 years since I sat in a room and wrote creatively with other women. It all started in a red building in a public housing complex, and each memory plays through my mind like an old movie reel. In that room, I learned to love myself a little bit more. It's where the mind expanded beyond my day-to-day -day living of an impoverished life. Surrounded by women who could see we needed something to pull us through the hard times one is born into, either through suffering or circumstance, <coughs> we found our own strength. Now one could argue that it was merely a creative writing class and that you would be right, but what is teaching creative writing but teaching creative thought? And from imagination springs dreams. I can still hear the remarks of how touching my words are, but my true love came from those evenings with those women. I fell in love with the written word and because of that love, I'm working toward a degree as a lab scientist. I now own my own home on a little piece of dirt with mountainous views that still stun me when my eyes gaze upon them. You can change your whole life if you picture it differently. Mm -hmm. Workshop participants needed to write their lives to picture their lives anew. Something I also found truth for my students at Goddard College where I began teaching in 1996. Telling their stories, understanding the myths that held sway over them, was instrumental to their studies. This understanding, coupled with the funny, under, funny realization that I could make a living in Kansas, not especially known, especially lately, if you know our governor, for support of the arts, just through writing workshops, led me to found the Transformative Language Arts degree at Goddard, and with others, co-create this emerging academic field, profession, and calling. When I attended my first NAPT, just as we were launching the Goddard program, I discovered all of you were dreaming the same dream. Although we might call the dream by different names, Narrative ther 